Alright, hey guys, what's up? Today we're going to be talking about Cecilia Najorf, one of the best openings that Black can play against 1e4. We're going to be looking at 30 of the most important ideas that you need to know, split into 6 different sections. But with that being said, let's get right into things. So to start off here, I think we should start from the very start, 1e4 here, and show the moves that reach Cecilia Najorf. For those who don't know here, so we play d6. White plays d4, trying to open up the center here. And knight takes d4, knight of 6, knight 3, and here black plays a6. And I just want to spend a bit of time discussing why does black play a6 in this position. And one very common uh, sort of reason that people say for this move a6 is that black in the future sometimes wants to play b5. And to gain some counterplay on the queen side, they might also want to develop the bishop to the b7 square. And this is very true in a lot of scenarios. However, there's another very important reason here, which is that very often in these positions, black is going to want to play e5 on the next move here. For example, after bishop e2, e5 is a very common move here. We're also going to discuss why in some positions black plays e5 and not e6, because in a lot of variations, these are both very playable options. Options, but these days a lot of players play e5 instead of e6 and I'm going to explain why soon. But it's also important to understand why can't we play e5 immediately, it seems like such a logical move here. And the reason is, is that bishop b5 check is possible here and this is a very annoying move for black to face. If we have the pawn in a6, bishop b5 check is not an option. And of course black has two different moves here, they can play bishop d7 but the drawback here is that now we're swapping off the light squared bishops here and after knight d2 we have a very weak light square on d5 here and this is strategically going to be very troublesome since we exchange off our light squared bishop already. Or if instead in this position after bishop b5 check we play knight b7, now white can play knight f5 here because our bishop is no longer controlling the square because the knight's blocking it and after something like a6 say, uh, after takes, takes here, it's a very unpleasant move, but like if we play bishop takes d7, then we fall into knight takes d6, so queen takes d7 protects this pawn, but again, after something like bishop g5 here, this is very annoying to face, because essentially what white's trying to do is they're trying to take here, and just destroy our control over the d5 square, for example, we just played h6, takes, takes, something like knight d5, and look at these knight outposts, very unpleasant here, and not a position that you want to land yourself into. And this brings us to another very fundamental idea in this position, which is how do we decide whether or not to play e6 or e5? And the general rule of thumb I'm going to give you is you play e5 against everything except bishop c4 or bishop g5. And the reason once again comes down to this factor of the d5 square, as we just saw in the first example, right, of how like we played e5 here, and after like, you know, all this stuff, you lost control over the d5 square here, and that's something very important to understand in a lot of Nigel positions. When we play e5 here, we have to monitor the d5 square very carefully because if we don't, we're going to end up strategically much worse. And the idea is, is that after a6, when black plays or white plays bishop g5 or bishop c4, in this case with bishop g5, they're not directly controlling the d5 square, but after e5, say like knight d2, or say if I think knight f5 is actually more accurate here, you can see that because the bishop has this pin on the queen here, uh, they're actually controlling the d5 square since our knight can't control it so well here. And the same with bishop c4, if in this position we go e5 here, again knight f5, and what we'd love to do in a lot of these positions is either play d5, or bishop f5, for example, in this position after bishop e3 here, e5, what will usually happen is knight b3 or knight f3. Knight f5 is basically not a thing because after d5 here, uh, we're challenging the control of the center here. If white simply takes this, they just hang a piece. Or we could even consider something like in this position, bishop takes f5, it's not quite as strong. Um, and then d5, whereas in these positions after bishop c4, something like this here, notice how we cannot simply play d5 because of the excess control of the square. In the same case with bishop g5, once again coming back to this position, again there's no way we're going to play d5, why it's just going to take the knight here and then win the d5 pawn. And if we're not able to play a move like d5 or bishop takes f5, gain rid of this knight in our territory, this is going to be very unpleasant because for example how do we develop? We can't play bishop e7 because knight takes g7 and if we play g6, knight h6, and again, if like we play bishop g7, we can't even really castle here because this knight has been such a pain in the ass. Which is why in these positions against bishop g5, we're not going to play e5, we're instead going to play e6. Bishop e7, queen 7 knight b7, try and go for a setup like this. I'm going to show some other ideas later on, but these are stuff to be aware of. And once again against bishop c4, we're going to play e6, bishop e7, castles, b5 or something like that, and have a fairly solid position. And so now flipping the board a little bit, I want to talk about things from white's perspective a little bit, and this is also important to understand if you're playing black here, because essentially white has two different types of subsequence in Najorf. There's more positional ones, and there's more aggressive ones, and 
The more aggressive ones, there are plenty of those, for example, bishop g5 here. We just saw this line where black goes e6, and very often white's going to go f4 here, queen f3 on castles here. Or once again, something like bishop c4, this is also quite aggressive, and a lot of times white will try and go something like bishop b3. Uh, they'll try go like, you know, castles here, bishop e7, f4, they'll try going f5, and really sort of make their mark on the king side here. But on the other hand, you also have more positional setups. You have something like maybe a4 here, or white sort of just tries to restrain black's activity on the queen side with b5, for example. Another very common idea is something like bishop e2. This was favoured a lot by Anatoly Karpov, a former world champion, who had a very positional style, right? To him, he really liked playing these bishop e2 lines a lot. And the reason I'm explaining this and showing to you guys is just so when you sit down to play a game and your opponent, you know, plays one of these moves, it's good to kind of know, like, and get in the right headspace of, like, what sort of position are we aiming for. It's like, if your opponent plays bishop g5 and you think, like, oh yeah, we're just going to have, like, a nice positional game, and then they end up throwing, like, all these crazy attacking moves at you, that's going to be quite unpleasant. So it's important you sort of know what you're getting yourself into. So somewhat in line with the ideas that we just talked about with where white can either pick a more sort of aggressive or positional sub, it's important I think to understand like where is black going to put their pieces, this is a very important part of the opening. And in general, uh, once again, like, you know, against bishop g5 or bishop c4, we're going to offer something like e6. Against these subs, generally speaking, the rule of thumb is we're going to put a bishop on e7, knight on d7, the queen c7, b5, bishop b7, we're going to castle short. That's our sort of general setup. It's going to vary a little bit the move order and stuff depending on the exact moves that white play. But in general, that's going to hold true. We're going to go for this sort of setup here. And with the setups where white allows us to play e5, for example, with bishop e3 here, and let's say e5, knight b3, bishop e6, f3 here, what we're going to want to do here is we're going to want to usually develop our bishop to e7, a knight to d7, castle short, bring queen to c7, b5, all that sort of good stuff here. And a lot of people will question, why don't we want to put a knight on c6? This looks like a very active square for our knight to be, but there are multiple reasons for why we do not want to do this. And a very concrete reason as to why here is after queen d2, bishop e7, long castles, castles here, white can play this very annoying move knight d5 here, and we can't just simply ignore this knight. For example, we just play rook c8 here, white's going to take this bishop here, and then simply grab a pawn, and they're going to be up material here. And if black can sit in this position, plays knight takes d5, of course, this runs into the problem e takes d5, forking both of these pieces, which essentially leaves them bishop takes d5 as the only move, but then after e takes d5, this knight has to move somewhere. But it doesn't really have any appealing squares. Can't go to a5, can't go to b4, can't go to d4, so that leaves a7 or b8, which aren't particularly attractive retreat squares, and that kind of begs the question, why did we bring this knight to the c6 square in the first place? And if we were just to run a small comparison here, coming back to this position of what black instead play knight bd7 here, play some moves to both sides, the exact same ones, I think white's best move here is g4 here, not knight d5, but let's say knight d5 anyway here. Uh, once again, we can actually play knight takes d5 here, and then bishop f5, since our knight wouldn't be on c6 gain forked, this is very playable. Or we could even in this position play bishop takes d5, e takes d5, and something like rook c8 maybe. And one idea that we can note here is we can go knight b6, and then sort of maybe jump into the c4 square, attack the d5 pawn. And this is important to understand here because it shows that the knight, although it might seem more passive on d7 square from just like a very sort of brief look at the position, actually it has more possibilities on the d7 square where it can maybe jump to b6 for example and hop into the very nasty c4 square or attack the d5 pawn as we're going to see more on later. And the last general aspect I want to discuss about the Sicilian Nagel, for honestly this applies to every single Sicilian more or less I believe, uh, is that endgames tend to be very very favourable for black here. And the example I'm going to show you here is a bit exaggerated because after age 6 here, uh, we're going to see this sort of uh, more in a later example here, um, and why white is playing bishop takes f6 and not something like bishop h4 because it's very natural. But after bishop takes f6 here, what we're going to see is something like this here, where we have just entered an end game, which to a lot of people might kind of seem like, okay, it's around equal. Some people who are slightly more educated might be like, okay, black has a bishop here, they probably have a slight advantage. But more over than just like those things aside here, the fact that black has the open C file is one of the determining factors of why these Sicilian endgames are so pleasant for black here. And some other factors that make this endgame so heavily in black's favour of the times, and look, I want to say it's like, when I say so heavily, I don't mean like winning, for example, it's not that bad, but it's definitely not pleasant for white to play this sort of thing. Black structure is very compact, they have no kind of easy weaknesses that white can target here, not to mention also that white, they sort of have more weaknesses because they're a little bit overextended, you could say, with their pawns here. For example, some of these dark squares could potentially come weak, 
And this is still sort of laid out general plan here, like what is black going to do concretely speaking, but we could maybe go like bishop e7, bishop d7, castle, sure, we could also even castle long, maybe, uh, double rooks in the c file eventually, play b5, b4 if allowed, and in general that's just a very promising game plan, there's not a whole lot that white can do to obtain counterplay here, so really just understand in general, because you have once again like the c file and all this stuff, the end game stealing are not something that you should generally shy away from with the black pieces, they're generally something you should be quite happy to go into. And so now getting to some more of the meat here of the Najov here, a very very important idea that you guys really need to come to grips with if you're going to play the Najov here, especially with e5, which is how basically all of the top players play it nowadays, is that you are creating an imbalance from the very start here, where you assert your sort of stronghold in the center here of a pawn on the e5 square, you're determining the central structure very early on, uh, but this does come at the slight cost of weakening the d5 square and creating this backward pawn on d6 here. And what this generally is going to mean going forward is that black is sort of going to have a bit more sort of uh, control of the dark squares here, and white's going to have a bit more control of some of the light squares. And as black here, you need to be very careful that you just don't completely lose control of what happens on these light squares, especially the d5 square. This is something that you need to fight like hell to really keep control of. Otherwise, if you're not careful, the game could very easily spiral out of control. And this example is a perfect one of what you should avoid at all costs with the black pieces here, and essentially white sword strategic dream here, which is after bishop d5 here. Well, what is white trying to do? Well, first of all, we should understand that knight d5 would not be as strong. This might not be quite decent here. Bishop d5 is a lot more forceful, and we're sort of trying to force our wing on black here, which is that we want which black sort of complied within the game to exchange bishops here, and then after knight takes d5, what do we have here? Well, we have this situation here where we have this very strong knight on d5, which can't really be challenged, black can't really push a pawn back to e6 and kick this knight out, and they have this dark sword bishop which also cannot challenge this knight on the d5 square here. And pretty much what this means for the player with the black pieces is they're going to be very passive for the rest of the game, white can sort of pursue whatever plan they want, they could maybe try pushing the queen side eventually, that's a little bit risky with this pawn here on b4, maybe pushing the king side, maybe just like triple heavy pieces on the c file, heck I don't really know, but there's a lot of things you can do here as white, where there's not a whole lot that you can really do with black other than just sit, wait, and hope that you don't die. But on the other side, the token here, I really want to show you guys the potential of black's position once they take full control of the d5 square, and they're able to push their pawn to d5 themselves. And so I'm going to show this game a little bit, so bishop g5 happened, e5, another very good move that I showed you guys earlier once again, because knight f5 is very unpleasant. In this game, white played knight b3 though, and didn't play it so well here, um, and essentially we got this position here, I'm not going to go too into depth with these moves here, uh, what we saw here was king h1, b5 here, and after knight b6 here, black has achieved very good control of the d5 square here, and you might be like, okay, like, what do we do next? And the answer is we complete d5 sometimes, just completely opening up the game, blowing everything up here, and why try taking, uh, but after a bunch of exchanges here, dust is settled, and what do we have here? We have a position where black has control of the center here, we are once again hammering down the c pawn here on the semi-open c file, we have the bishop here, maybe we can push this pawn to e4 one day, but we also have to be careful not like just weakening the d4 square or something, maybe knight d4 could be annoying there, but in general here this is sort of like the dream Sicilian Najwolf sort of position, and this is something that you should keep in mind every time you play the Najwolf of black. So to wrap up this section on the d5 square here, I want to show you guys another very important idea, which you saw a little bit of earlier, uh, but I really kind of want to explain this more in depth to you guys and how you can sort of approach the situation. So sometimes what's going to happen here is why is it simply going to play a move like knight d5 here, because if, I mean if they play a move backwards and then allow something like d5. So they stop that by playing knight d5 themselves here, and of course we play knight takes d5, in this situation if the pawn was back here, maybe bishop f5 would be playable, but of course that's not really possible in this situation, so a lot of the times what we will do to meet knight d5 is to play bishop takes d5, giving up our knight squared bishop here, and a lot of the times this would sort of be, you know, giving up the knight squared bishop, a positional catastrophe, but it's not really that bad because white has their pawn on d5 themselves here, which means that they can't really make use of this square as a weakness because they occupy it. And so from here, black played a5, protecting the b4 pawn here, but also threatening to push a4, which happened in the game after king b1 here, a4, knight c1 here, 
And this is a very important idea to understand in all these positions here. Once you've already played bishop takes d5 and e takes d5 has happened, you can play knight b6 here and now attack this d5 pawn, which is very difficult for white to defend now. And if they play a move like bishop takes b6, which they might have to, uh, after queen takes b6 here, it's important to really take stock of this sort of position and understand what's going on here. And so essentially in this position, we have this sort of situation where we have opposite colored bishops here. And because the middle game is generally decided where when there's opposite colored bishops, the side who has an advantage is the one who's attacking here, and black is much more advanced on the queen side than black is on the king side here. I'd say that white definitely is the one who has a disadvantage here. Maybe at some point we'd like to play e4 if, you know, white just took that and played knight takes e4. We'd love to be able to spring a bishop to the f6 square and really kind of use that diagonal uh, for our bishop. Uh, but in general here, this is not a very pleasant position for white. We might also just try and like sack a pawn with something like b3 to like crash open there. And all on all, black is doing very well here. Also, I'm going to touch on this a bit more later, but it's also very important to understand that the dark sword bishop is a very important piece for white. It's one of the most important minor pieces, maybe their most important one. And when they give this up positionally, it's just not something that they really want to do. They lose a lot of attacking potential when they do this. And so for this next part, one really aspect of the Nagel that I'd like to discuss are those positions in which opposite side castling occurs, especially in many open Sicilian positions. This is something that very often happens and you need to kind of be well equipped to understand what to do in these sorts of positions. And to begin with, I just want to discuss a little bit when is it that it is suitable for white to castle long, because usually it's white who choose whether to castle long or not. Black usually more or less always universally castles kingside. So white kind of has the option if they castle kingside or queenside. And basically the, the shorthand heuristic I'm going to give you guys is that when white plays something like bishop e3 or bishop g5 or any sort of like aggressive setup they have in mind, in general castling long is sort of what white will do. With the exception that when they play bishop c4, even though this is sort of an aggressive setup that's always an attack on a Bobby Fish's favorite lines, in this line, black, sorry, white usually doesn't want to castle long. And the reason is if we look a few moves deeper, for example, if white tries to go for this sort of setup, which they often do in the English attack here, after these moves here, uh, where they go for a similar setup of long castling here, here this is much better than in this position. And the reason is, is precisely because we have the bishop on the queen side here, which in the future is going to become a target for our pawns here. B4 is definitely not... Uh, a strange sort of occurrence by any means, we're more than happy to see this on the board, but what we're not so happy is that after a5 here, a4, and now this bishop all of a sudden is really feeling out of place here on the queen side, because it's more or less a, just a target uh, for black's queen side pawns to attack, gain tempi, and this is something that we want to avoid at all costs here, which is usually why in these positions here, why always castles king side instead of queen side, going to the opposite side casting stuff, here they just focus on pushing the pawns on the king side like this, and sure, black can push their queen side pawns like this still, but it's nowhere near as big of a deal as if the king were castled there. However, just some other variations which are good for white where they can castle long are the bishop g5 one. I think I mentioned this one earlier. White castle long here, perfectly fine here. Uh, black can try to consider the b5 push. They have to time it precisely, otherwise things could go quite wrong as we're going to see later. You know, the b5 idea, once again, it's there, but it doesn't come with tempo. It doesn't like attack any bishop on c4 or anything like that. So that's quite good news for us. Again, the bishop e3 one I mentioned earlier, this is also a very playable uh, variation for white, where they cast along like this, they're going to go g4, h4, and that's very possible. But otherwise, once again, like more position lines like 6 bishop e2, you're always going to be casting long here, stuff like a4 I mentioned earlier, again, you're not going to be casting long here, especially not when you played a4 here, because I mean, that just weakens the queen side way too much to ever really consider something like that. So in these positions, you're always going to be casting short as well. So now that we know these sort of possibilities exist and when white is most unlikely to castle queenside and go for the opposite side castling, what are exactly your black strategies to cope with this? And I mean, white strategies are usually very straightforward to sort of push forward the pieces, attack for their pieces somehow, uh, but black is often the one who's supposed to need to defend against this, so how do they go about this? And I'm going to show one very nice idea here, which is in the English attack here, and this can actually occur in another variation as I'm going to show very shortly, uh, but we can actually go in these positions h5 here and prevent white from playing g4 and pursuing the king's side attack that they often do. And what this really does is it forces the game to really go away from that very sharp concrete sort of thing 
and it forces the game to take on actually a bit more of a positional nature, which might seem a bit weird given the move like h5 looks completely wild and outrageous, it looks very anti-positional, but in fact it really does make the game a lot more positional. Because for example after queen d2, even in these positions when long castling happens, it's not really that easy for white to really start something on the king side. Sometimes they'll try and go like h3 and prepare g4, but we still play h4 and it's not so easy for once again them to really push here if they ever take uh, play g4. Now we just take Hompasson and their kingside attacking dreams aren't really going anywhere so that's not really something we should be concerned about. And another variation which is h5 idea occurs is in the Adams variation where in this position white can play h3 and after e5 here knight d2 black can once again play this move h5 here simply preventing g4 and again the game is sort of forced away from a more sort of aggressive tone and more towards a positional one where white could do numerous things they could play bishop g5 they might play g3 bishop g2 either way they're not going to be getting in that sharp attacking game that they wanted to coming back to this position however it is worth sort of understanding some of the ideas that might happen and are at the disposal of black and white in these sorts of positions where we don't play h5 but instead just opt for a more sort of typical sort of development where we simply allow white to go for their g4 plan and we hence also play on the queen side as we logically would right it's a bit of a pawns race now for both sides white plays g5 and a lot of people maybe just be tempted to move the knight somewhere to h5 or e8 or something but the best move in this position or at least one of the best ones is to go b4 here counter attacking the white knight here if white takes, we take back, and there are some positions where, you know, white will play knight f5, this is really studied very deeply on a theoretical level, you don't need to know this super well here, just know that this exists, but also what does exist is white could instead simply play a move like knight e2 here, and after something like knight e8, by the way, if white takes this pawn, I think d5 is very dangerous, create a discovered attack, we're going to go d4 next, very unpleasant, so what white usually will do instead is f4, once again trying to march forward with their pawns here, creating some attacking chances, if we take this, then there might be something like bishop takes f4. And now because we lack that pawn in e5 here, we need to be very careful because white's pieces are going to come to the game. Maybe a knight like this, maybe h4, h5. This is very unpleasant. We need to be aware of this, uh, which is why usually in this position, black plays a5. And you might say, what happens if f5? And the idea is not that we simply want to move this bishop. This is going to be incredibly slow. Instead, what black usually does is we play a4, creating a counterattack on the knight here, an intermediate uh, attack rather. And after something like takes, we go takes here. And this is absolutely bananas, but this is fury here. And after something like takes, you get a very complicated position. The idea is not all this fancy fury. You can memorize this if you want, if this is the line you want to play instead of going like h5 here, for example. But the idea rather is just understand these sorts of positions. Time is of the essence. You don't have time to waste, just, you know, making like slow retreats here. Like, um, you know, doing something like in this position, for example. Black doesn't really want to just simply like play bishop c4. Time is of the essence. We need to create an immediate counterattack here. Otherwise, we're just going to get walked over. For example, we played a move like this. Maybe something like f6 would be very dangerous. And we have to be aware that we're not just going to get rammed over if we do play something like this. And another really good example came from the bishop g5 Najov. Actually, I'm just going to bang out some moves here. Where in this position, I'm just going down the rap call of Fury here. Note the bishop takes g5 check as an option. This is completely irrelevant, but it's very dangerous opening up the g file like this. And also there's some stuff here where white might like take here on e6 eventually and get some sort of check here. That's a thing. And after rook g1 here, basically, we go castle instead um, and allow rook g1 before we go into this thing. And basically in this position, the idea I want to show you guys is that notice how we're attacking the knight here on d4. And many people, what they do just simply move the knight away, not really think too much of anything else. They'll just be like, oh, okay, my knight's attacked, I move it. That's the completely wrong mindset to have in this position. You're about to run white over, sorry, black over, and black is about to run you over. You can't just be mindlessly moving around pieces. That's not how this type of position works. What you need to do is really understand, once again, that time is of the essence and play f6, counter attacking on the king side here. And sure, your knight might hang, but so does black's bishop here. Also, I should note that taking here in any sort of scenario is absolutely suicidal, opening up the g file. Instead, after e takes d4 here, we get this sort of position. And, you know, once again, I'm not telling you to memorize this, but we get some sort of position where we're in a no rush to 
win back the pawn on e5, we can win this back on the next move here. And that is complicated, but basically what I want to show you is this f6 move exists. And why is it that white doesn't want to play a move like knight b3? And this is actually what I really want to show you guys. It's that here black can play f6. Now, shut down any f6 ideas from white because they were one move too late to the show here. But they have a good g6, we're going to go h6, completely shutting down any ideas on the king side now. We're going to go a5, a4. What happens is they play g takes f6, or once again knight takes f6. If they ever, you know, try to double heavy pieces on the g file, we're just going to like rook f7, maybe sidestep the king to h8, a5, a4 here, and we could maybe even play something like bishop b7 and attack the weak e4 pawn here. Not a position that you want to play with the white pieces here. So in this next section, what I really want to talk about are some of the really common tactical ideas that you need to be aware of from both the white and black side here, especially the ones that white can launch at you because it's one thing to be aware of your own ideas and your own strategic plans, but especially from white's perspective, because especially white's going to be the one who's throwing oftentimes these more like dangerous attacking ideas that you don't get me wrong, black has their own. But generally, from my own experience, white's the one who's trying to, you know, deal all the dangerous boys, and if black can kind of weather the storm a little bit, then they can usually come out okay. But first, we have to be aware of what are these dangerous ideas, and how do we play against them. And the very first one I want to show is in the bishop g5 Najov. This is a very dangerous knight sacrifice, which, if you're not aware of, you might just die very quickly. And I've seen it happen many times. I've been on the delivery side of this a couple of times when I was younger. Lucky to get the chance to. And essentially what happens is white has these very active looking, you know, centrally placed pieces right now. And if black plays move like b4 here, attacking this knight on c3, you might just want to ask yourself for a second, where are you going to put this knight? And for many people, it's going to be on square like a4, e2, god forbid, b1, very uninspiring stuff here. However, the best move, which a lot of people, it's like you just don't see it until you see it, is knight d5 here. And the basic idea is that after takes here, takes. Look at our pieces. Rook on the open file here, knight f5, queen's eye in this pawn if we ever take it. It could slide into g7, very nasty stuff. And if you're not careful, you could just completely lose with black here in a couple moves. Uh, the only move here is to play king d8, but a lot of people might just want to play something like castles here. And of course, you can't really do this because you hang the bishop here. White's the one who's up material now, not to mention we have a raging attack here. So this sort of knight sacrifice is always something that you need to keep an eye out for, because it might just slaughter your opponent, or, well, if you're the Najwa player, it might just slaughter you. And so the next one I want to discuss is another very dangerous sacrifice, which I'd argue the two most common sacrifices in Najwa, at least from my narrow perspective, is the knight d5 one that we saw in the last example and the one I'm going to show you here. So what very often happens, this one by the way, usually almost always occurs in the Sozin variation, one of Bobby Fischer's favorite lines, where after e6, bishop b3, black can also play stuff like b5, but knight b7 is very common. Castles here, a very common mistake here is people will be like, okay, well, when I play chess, I want a castle, so bishop e7 and castling seems very logical. The only problem is, is this doesn't take into account the concrete factors of the position. A better move from black is to instead play something like knight c5 here, we're going to talk about this more later. But bishop e7, why is this bad? Why can take on e6? So what? I take back, but then I take back. And now the queen's under attack, you move it, knight takes g7, and almost always when one side is able to get this sort of thing here, when they take on e6 and get three pawns for it, check the king like this and then bring a knight back to f5 like this, it is almost always bad for black and this is no exception here. Black is just very passive, we might bring the queen in somehow, develop the bishop, black's king has absolutely no shelter, a knight will come to d5, maybe we'll push the pawns, I know it's pinned at the moment. But all sorts of crazy ideas, we might even just simply give the knight up for that bishop, which is a very important defender. And these positions really are not something that you want to get yourself into with the black pieces. As white, this is your best dream. So don't let this happen. Instead, in this sort of position, at the very least, it's like, by the way, I should note that in this position here, that this is not really a threat because after something like takes here, uh, you can't take on g7. So when the bishop is still on f8, this is okay. Once you move the bishop, though, that's a different story, which is why in these positions here, you know, you'd want to play something like uh, knight c5 first to protect this, and only then go bishop e7 and castle. So once again, coming back to the bishop g5 variation, one of the craziest variations on the Najor, which I've probably said 10 times in this video already, e6 here, f4, bishop e7. And in this position here, black should play knight bd7, as we've briefly looked at, but I haven't really discussed 
And why is this exactly? Why do they need to develop the knight before playing b5? And if you'd like to pause the video, I encourage you to. If you don't want to, that's okay. The move here is to play e5. Busting open the center, attacking this rook on a8 now. And why does this work? Precisely because there is no knight on d7. And if we go bishop b7, queen g3. If there was a knight on d7 right now, they would be able to take, take, and like win a pawn if queen takes e5 or something. Unfortunately, that's just not the case here because after takes, takes, now this knight has to move. And if they move here, we go queen h4, we take and we take and... Now the knight is kind of surrounded here, so they go g6 and protect it. And if black could just castle here and sort of do that, they, they might be okay here. But the problem is, is that black's king is still in the center. It's on e8, so we can simply just play bishop takes b5, I say simply, but you know, <laughs> you have to know this exists to some extent. Now after takes, knight takes b5 here, queen b6, knight d6 check here, and this is absolutely done. So king f8 here, rook h f1. And not only, I think, what's the material count? Okay, we have two pawns for the piece, not quite free. But it doesn't even really matter. Like, forget the pawns, forget the material count. Look at white king, look at our pieces. You're not you're not surviving this. I, I don't care who you are. You're, you're dead meat here. Like, f5 here is pretty much your only move here. But then just e takes f6. Um, You know, we could play queen h6 next. F7 maybe. I mean, you're, you're just not surviving this. Like, Again, don't care who you are, absolutely dead position. And it's one thing that you need to be very careful about when you play an early b5 with black. Very often it might just be premature because of a move like e5 here, particularly with this queen on f3 where it eyes the rook on a8 here. And once again, I feel like there's two variations that we keep talking about, the Sozin and Bishop g5, but these variations are full of tactics. Which is why you need to be really careful when you go into them. And this time we're going to see this variation where black doesn't play knight d7 and bishop e7 falling into the bishop e6 screen. Uh, and they're instead going to try and attack the e4 pawn. But something you need to be very aware of when you go into this with the black pieces is that you kind of have to lay off things a little bit and not really just grab on e4 immediately. Because if you do this here, what well, the best move is to go knight bd7 here. And then if you know, white goes f5, which is their plan here, then go e5, and there's some stuff here we can talk about this more later, but the really thing that I want you guys to understand here is that you shouldn't just grab an e4 immediately. This is very risky, because think about things first from this perspective. You haven't really got many of your pieces involved. Now you're grabbing this pawn on e4 here, and after takes, takes here, after f5 here, white's trying to like, you know, burst things open now with this move f5 here. You really don't want to take here, because after knight takes f5, once again, this diagonal is open, this file is open, queen e2 might be a threat next. And how does black de develop really? I, I don't know. So uh, instead here, what looks very logical is to go e5, but even this is not so good here. And once again, it's not because we're going to play some cowardly backward move with our knight here, it's because we're going to go straight in for the attack here with a move like queen h5 here. And after something like queen d7, again, just bringing all the pieces in rookie one. Uh, if you play d5 here, um, like if you... I don't know, retreat the bishop somewhere. I can't imagine this being so good. This isn't even a threat, really. So d5 seems very logical. But then knight e6, and this is just incredibly scary here. And there's some more engine stuff here, like bishop e3 and rook d1. And this is very scary. And the point is not that, like, maybe your opponent won't find all these moves, but just to understand that playing this kind of way where you grab a pawn very early on, it might be playable in some situations, but be very careful about doing it when your king is still in the center and your opponent, especially when they have a bishop on the diagonal like this, and you've just opened it up by playing e5 here. This is incredibly dangerous stuff, by the way, if you go g6 here, I mean, we can just take, right? And like, uh, if bishop takes, bishop takes f7. And I mean, if you take back this way, I can't imagine this is much better. I think probably still bishop f7, like this is. So yeah, you gotta be very careful and, uh, when you go into these types of positions, instead just focus on development and not grabbing this pawn too early on. So now getting towards some of the more tactical ideas from the black perspective here, I'm going to show a blitz game of mine which happened many years ago when I myself was a big Nigel player here. And one of the ideas which is very common, especially in the Cillian Dragon, but it happened here in my Nigel game and can occur sometimes in many lines as well, uh, is this idea where Sometimes you simply just play rook takes c3, and in the dragon, uh, very often it's going to be the sort of rec white king side structure, sorry, queen side structure, where the king's castled on this side of the board, and so it has that sort of strategic purpose underlying it. Uh, but in this position here, it's also possible because after simply taking here, there's all sorts of weird possibilities where after, like, for example, queen takes c3, knight takes e4 here, 
And if white takes this, like, if they don't, I mean, what are they doing, right? Like, I've got a pawn for the exchange already. This bishop's opened up like crazy. I don't even know what they do here. Like, if queen d1, maybe? Maybe there's, like, I don't know. Like, again, they could not even ruin me for any of this because if bishop takes e4, we have this fork here. So maybe we could even just do something like queen h4. I don't know. But let's say what they did in the game was f takes, e4 takes, takes. Bishop takes f5. And what's happening here? Well, technically, actually, material is already equal because we have two pawns for the exchange here. And on top of that, what we can do in this sort of position is play move like d5, maybe open this bishop up on this diagonal, and maybe like bring the queen into the action, attack uh, white's king here. And we also just in general, like, I mean, if you think about it, king safety wise, our king is very safe. There's no way in hell they're going to be able to touch our king here. Whereas white's king here has no pawn shelter here, and that is going to be very dangerous in the near to soon future. So white has to be very aware and careful about that. And this tactical idea I'm going to show now, this one is going to be, it's quite sort of particular and it's not very applicable across many variations, but it's one that I found myself occurs quite often actually and a lot of players just seemingly fall into it without really realizing what they did wrong and basically it's in this position after e6, bishop g5 variation. With many players, they, I mean the best idea we've seen it multiple times is go f4, queen f3, but why is it that white can't just play queen d2, long castles, do very natural stuff? Uh, like they do in the English attack, right? This is what they do. Why doesn't this work here? And it's precisely because here, black plays h6 here. White has various options here, but none of them are good here. Their best move might actually be the take on f6, but this, as we're going to see later, isn't... Uh, actually, I think I showed this line earlier, actually, uh, where we had this whole endgame line, and this sort of thing just is uh, not very pleasant, as we've already discussed. Uh, so bishop f6 is not so great, and bishop e3 runs into this very annoying move knight g4, as we're going to discuss earlier, uh, sorry, later rather, white doesn't really want to give up the dark sword bishop, it's a very important piece in all sorts of positions in the Nigel, which then seems to leave bishop h4, which many of you were already maybe thinking, like, why aren't we playing this move bishop h4, it's so bloody natural, but the problem here is that compared to this position earlier, just one move earlier, right, this bishop is protected by the queen here. On h4 it's not, it's it's as loose as it can be. And now after knight takes e4 here, knight takes e4, we see how that comes into play if queen takes h4. And some people might look at this position and be like, oh, but black's behind development here, white has all these active looking pieces. But the problem is that it just doesn't really do anything actually in this position here. Uh, if white tries to do something like this, you know, uh, by the way, we can't really take it because bishop b5 checks and a bit oopsie wrote, uh, so instead what might happen is like knight c6 or I don't know like even bishop e7 and just short castles and I mean how is white using the like lead development I don't really see it to be honest so it's really just sort of like imaginary compensation here black is pretty much winning here they have the bishop here they have these central pawns absolutely nothing that white can do here this is pretty much just a bonder bishop h4 and by the way if after knight takes e4 they play bishop takes d8 then we just get an endgame of pawn up here, they can run the bishop away somewhere, uh, but we're lucky that our knight's not getting trapped because we can play knight takes f1, and uh, we are just simply up a pawn this endgame, shouldn't be too much trouble converting this. So now hopping into one of the really most interesting sections of this video, at least in my opinion here, which is going to be the one on strategy, and there's a lot of really interesting stuff here, and the first one I'd like to really get to you guys is this one where uh, well, first of all, I'm just going to show this line here earlier where we've looked at this multiple times, I believe, already this video, where we get this sort of position. Earlier, we saw one where black played b5, bishop b7 here. We went, where was it, queen g3, b4, and white had this knight d5 sacrifice. And some people might seem like, what do I do then if white's going to play this line against me? And the answer is here is that you don't play b5, actually. Instead, you go for something uh, which white might not be expecting, and you go for h6 here. And the big idea here is that you might like think, oh, why goes bishop h4? Can't I, I mean, don't I just still have to go b5? But the answer is no, you don't here. You can go g5, actually. And you might look at this and be like, whoa, dude, slow down here. Like, what, what is g5 about? Am I not just losing the pawn after takes, takes, takes? But the answer, first of all, is like, no, you're not. You're not losing the pawn. Sometimes you do sack a pawn, but it's not like you're just losing the pawn outright. There's compensation for it. But the second point is that in this specific variation here, you can go knight e5 here. And after queen e2, knight fg4. And most often you're going to simply be winning the pawn back on the next move with g takes h5 here sorry h takes g5 rather and basically you're going to in exchange for playing all these weird moves you have very nice control over the dark squares in particular this knight on e5 here has a very nice outpost because we deflected the f pawn 
away from that square where it was controlling e5 here. And, you know, it's not like black is winning or anything, but it's definitely a complicated position where black has their own share of the chances here. And, okay, I should note, you can't just take another pawn here because that would hang a piece. I hope people are noticing that. But otherwise, like, in this position, sometimes white might play a move like h3 here, and we can play it in between uh, h takes g5, so that's nothing to be worried about. They take, we take. And once again, we have very nice control of the dark squares here. Bishop d7 here and long castles might happen. One of the few variations in which we're actually going to castle that way, but nonetheless a very good position for black here. And to just show this isn't like a one-off sort of pawn sacrifice, there's actually another variation in the bishop g5 line in which this occurs, where black, they don't go with e6 here, they actually go knight bd7. And it's a very tricky line here, where it's specifically targeted actually against the self with white goes f4 and queen f3. White's better off going for some other stuff like bishop c4 or queen 2, but that's another story here. The line I want to show though is where white goes f4 here, queen c7, queen f3 here. And we sort of get an improved version upon what we just saw here, where we can go g5 here. And again, we get this sort of variation here, where this time we go queen c5 instead forking these pieces. So bishop e3 looks very logical. But then knight e5 gains a very important tempo on the queen. Then knight to g4 here, forcing this bishop back to g1 here. Now after bishop h6, all our pieces are in the game really, and we're once again just playing against the dark squares here. White can't even castle this way. In this position here, if white does play a move like h3 here, this is going to run into bishop f4 now, and if they take, I mean, of course, there's going to be rook takes h1. So extremely unpleasant position here. It's not really clear what white is supposed to do here, and this is one of the big appeals of this variation, and once again, really shows the power of all these g5 ideas, even though they may sacrifice poor and black, gets extremely good control over the dark squares here. And once again, the dark squares is often where a lot of black's play takes place in the Nigel. And the slightly less exciting version of these g5 ideas or implementation, shall we say, comes from the h3 variation in the Nigel. Very often, um, what we saw earlier, right, where black can go something like this and play h5. Another very interesting idea black can pursue is do e6 here and into more of a Skeveningen type setup. We mentioned very earlier on, like, black can play e6 to e5. And, you know, in all these variations, right, they can go e5 here, they can go e6. And both of these have their pros and cons. These days, it's just most people go e5. But one cool idea of e6 in these positions, at the very least, in my opinion, is that sometimes we can go g5 here. And really, once again, we it looks very stupid to just play, like, g5 on the side. It looks completely weakening. But... This actually was played by Garrick Sparov in his comeback. It was, a, I think, the St. Louis tournament. It was like some Blitz tournament where he made a big comeback. I'm not sure if you guys remember or not. But he essentially played this move G5, which shocked a lot of people, including myself here. But the idea, once again, is to take control of the dark squares here. If white ever plays F4 here, positionally speaking, it's sort of like good for black in a weird way because we, uh, once again, well, I mean, to begin with, if like, this ever happens, well, in this position, it just wants a piece because of e5, but if we turn like that doesn't exist here, essentially what we've done is we've traded this sort of g-pawn, which is closer to the flank, compared to white's more central f-pawn here, and they've also created an isolated e-pawn. And dynamically, this might not matter so much because white just might mate us in the short term, but if we can, like, establish our pieces in good squares, like an eye on the e5 square or bishop, on this diagonal, I don't know, like positionally speaking, we might get a very good situation. And that's once again, sort of what we're aiming for when we play this G5 move here. And so in the last few examples, we've seen a lot of this G5 stuff here, and it really kind of highlights the importance of how important the dark squares are in the Najov for black. And that also really should bring us to the point of which I've talked about a couple of times of how white darks with bishop is such an important piece here. And they don't just want to allow black to win it easily for nothing. Otherwise, like for example, here, a very common move for black in this position is to play knight g4 here. And white's most popular move is bishop g5, a funny idea by the way, it happens sometimes to bishop c1 here and after knight gf or knight f6 rather. Some people will just repeat moves or sometimes people will decide in this position like they'll just play like f3. And then bishop e3 and try and go for the English attack without all these knight g4 ideas. But the sort of most critical line against uh, knight g4 is bishop g5 instead, and then they get the bishop chased around this way. Uh, and once again, g5, I must note. And uh, however, what I will add though is that some people might just sort of look at this and be like, well, can't I just play a move like queen d2 here and ignore the fact you're attacking my knight and just focus on development? And 
Like, yeah, but also just no, you can't do that because this piece is so important. It doesn't matter how much development you get in this case. This sort of position just can't be good where you give up the Dark Sword Bishop. Your Dark Sword Bishop is what often gives you a lot of the attacking chances in the Sicilian or like open Sicilian. So, uh, no, giving this up is a strategic disaster here, and I'd already reckon the black is a fair bit better here. And to further exemplify this, I just want to show this position which I had in the Blitz game a while ago. I'm not sure when this was from, I just found it. And basically, in this position, my opponent made a mistake with queen d2 here. And the reason is that after knight e5 here, there are two threats that white needs to deal with. One is knight takes g4, and they might protect us with a move like f3 here, although they actually need to deal with this pawn hanging as well here. Um, so I think they castled, like, well, no, they played g5 rather. But the problem here is that it's like, who cares about the, the, the g pawn, honestly? The most important thing is the fact we have knight c4 here, and the we're simply forking the king and bishop, sorry, the queen and bishop here, and also something like queen e2 takes, takes here, and okay, we can win a pawn after h takes g5 and all that, but what's really important here is we won the dark sword bishop here. Now, from a strategic point of view, white is really shit out of luck, and black has a very good position here. So now switching gears to more of a positional line, we haven't looked at this I feel like at all this video, maybe we have, I, I just forget, um, but this is one with Bishop E to once again a favour of Anatoly Karpov here, and we're going to see this move E5 here. And a very common idea in these positions is eventually for black to play this, sorry, white to play this move F4 here. And one thing about this move that you have to understand is that, uh, I mean one, okay, white's just running F5 and if we just play a move like this, that, that's very unpleasant here, white's going to storm the king side here. We need to be very aware of these sorts of possibilities. So what usually happens in these positions after f4 is black is going to play some sort of move e6 f4 and after takes here knight c6 and say king h1 here there's two sorts of plans that you can go for in these sorts of positions and the one that I like most is to play d5 because once again in the knowledge of remember the d5 square if you can push and it's good it's usually good. So uh, d5 here is a very good possibility after something like this. We can even play queen takes d5 here and it might look like very drawish after this sort of position but in reality to me I feel like black is a decent winning chance here. We have a very active bishop on the d5 square. Maybe can bring bishop to this diagonal here and all in all I just like black's chance, sorry white's, ch yeah black's chances quite a lot here and if white says play something like e5 here not exchanging we can go knight e4. However, there is another strategy here which is sort of aiming at keeping the tension more in the position here, not opening things up prematurely of d5. Well, not prematurely, it's perfectly uh, playable here. There's not really any drawback, but you could instead go for something like 95 and just keep more tension in the position. Maybe if you're really wanting to play for a win here, you could play a move like 95, uh, bring a rook to c8 here, and sort of eventually maybe like bring a knight to here, put a bishop on f6, put in this diagonal here, or even try playing bishop g5, trade off the dark sword bishops once again. And this sort of thing is playable, but personally I'm... I'm not sure I'd say I'm not a big fan of it. I've played like this before. The one thing is that you have to understand though is that when you play e takes f4, you've given up the d4 square. So now white can bring their pieces into more active squares as well uh, and play moves like knight d4 here. So black isn't the one who has necessarily all the fun here. White has ideas of their own which you need to be a little bit careful of. However, with regards to this f4 idea from white here, what you need to be once again very kind of aware of is that once again remember how it's showing these lines bishop e3 bishop e6 f4 here the the dangerous thing that white could do in this position here was to play f5 and gain a 10 point our bishop and then just storm the king side like that however when our bishop is back on c8 here what does f4 really do here and the unfortunate answer is really not much and what that basically means is since they're not running f5 to keep this bishop away since it's back on c8 that means that black can just do our own thing here and just play b5 and all of a sudden, what we're going to do is we're going to be like, okay, well, uh, you know what? I don't really care about the fact that, uh, you know, you're doing this F4 stuff. I can just do my own thing. And if white, say, plays a move like A3, which I'm going to talk about later, how this isn't so great here. But white can just once again do our own thing. Bishop B7, attack this pawn here. Knight BD7, uh, Rook C8, Queen C7. And because, once again, this, like, F5 move doesn't come with tempo and hitting this bishop here, White needs to be very aware of the fact that their e4 pawn's a bit of a weakness here, and this isn't a very fun position to play for White now. And so I've already briefly touched on this earlier, but I just wanted to create like its own like sort of section in this video because I just think it's a very important idea to really understand and internalize on some level, which is the fact that in this line, when black faces a sozin and white plays bishop b3, there's two sort of things we can do. I've already showed both these b5 here or knight b7. 
And 9b7 I've always been a big fan of, and the reason is, is that in this position here after like, like f4 or castles here, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to play knight c5 here. And what we're basically saying is that white, I understand how dangerous of an attacking piece your bishop is, all these bishop takes e6 sacks that occur in all sorts of lines here. So to avoid all those headaches that can occur in all these possible lines here, I'm going to eliminate this bishop as early as possible here. Not to mention I'm adding some pressure on the e4 pawn, but remember what I was telling you earlier, be a little bit careful about taking the pawn in e4 so early. What we're more focused on rather is attacking this bishop here, trying to swipe it off the board very early, and also defending this e6 pawn, uh, which once again, as I discussed earlier, can be a bit of a weakness uh, in many positions. So coming back to this position that we just looked at a bunch earlier, uh, we looked at all sorts of stuff here, we looked at in this position, we looked at the premature f4, we've also seen bishop e3, bishop e6, f4 takes takes, and like say for example knight 6 and d5 here. I, one idea I want to show you guys is b5 here, and we saw how b5 was good against f4, but what about against bishop e3? And this is actually very instructive here. In b5 we've seen how in some cases it can be rather premature and can be punished, and you might be wondering, well, what about here? Like, I mean, I don't know what to do here. And a lot of people will be like, okay, I'm just going to play a3 because I don't know what to do here. But this is an absolutely terrible move. a3, honestly, rarely ever leads to good stuff in the Sicilian. And the reason is, once again, is that because time is of the essence. And a3 is just a very slow move here, which now allows black to play stuff like bishop b7, f3, knight b7. They have a very harmonious development. Maybe they'll bring queen to c7. Maybe at some point we'll even be able to break in the center of d5, as we've already seen before. Which may then kind of beg the question here, well, what does white do in this position? And this is sort of what I want to show you guys. Generally speaking, uh, when you face a move like b5 and it's sort of premature, at least in this position, what you would do is, instead of going a3, which is very passive, you can strike back at the pawn here with this move a4. And now b4 here, knight d5 here. And once again, remember how I said earlier, the move like knight takes e4. It might look like it's possible, but you have to be very careful. And in this situation here, what we can do to punish it is to play this move bishop f3. Also be careful, you can't really win with this and this because actually this bishop b7. For I'll point that out. But nonetheless, bishop f3, and basically what happens now, if you retreat the knight, uh, will we go boom, 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 and win a rook for free. And if they go instead f5 here, what we're going to do is we're going to go boom this way, and then we're going to play queen d5 check. And with the fork here, we're simply picking up a rook. Which essentially means coming back to this position here after b4, knight d5, black more or less has to play this move, uh, bishop b7 here. But the problem here is that now after knight b6 here, uh, they're in a very precarious situation here where they go like, Rook a7, we might have like knight c8 and just like win the exchange here. So usually what white, sorry, black will do in this situation is they'll just like take here and just like more or less content themselves with the exchange sack. And I mean, white is better here. We could even do like other stuff that's even better than sacking the exchange. Apparently like we could take here and then play f3. And essentially what we're saying is you guys just have a backward d pawn here. I'm just going to play some poor positional moves here uh, and just simply have a better position. And that is probably true. Which is why, once again, coming back to this position here, always be in the lookout for, like, if you can strike b5 with a move like a4, because if you can, you're probably going to get a very good position. But once again, in this bishop e2 variation, on the topic of, like, this move a4 here, like, it's important to really understand one of the drawbacks of white playing this very early on. And I've mentioned how earlier in the video, you know, black often wants to put their knight on the d7 square. Uh, on c6 and can sometimes end up in the way a little bit. Uh, but in this position here, this is a unique example of where knight c6 actually is a very good move. And the reason is precisely because white has just played this move a4 here. And in these positions, one very nice idea is that we can actually just pop a knight onto the b4 square where it helps control the d5 square, as I mentioned earlier and have mentioned throughout the video many times. It's just an incredibly important square in Nigel. And basically what we're doing here is since white has their pawn on a4 here, we are allowed to basically just put the knight here and it's not easy for them to deal with it. Because for example, if we were to imagine like the pawn's back on e2, then of course they could kick the knight away with a move like a3, but with the pawn a4, that's just not true. They might try and play a move like a5 to be like, oh, I'm going to play rook a4 next and, and kick your uh, knight away. But unfortunately, that's just not true because after say rook c8, rook a4 here, we can go d5 and now the rook kind of looks stupid here. Our bishop is defending the knight here and if we just make a bunch of exchanges here, I mean, look at our pieces very nicely placed here. They can't just continue taking. Our knight is adequately defended here. This bishop's being attacked rather annoyingly. 
Uh, so pretty good all in all for black here. And really goes to show that white needs to be uh, a little bit careful when they play move like a4 here because we can once again put our knight on an annoying outpost like the b4 square. And coming back again, I feel like I've said that phrase like a million times in these videos, but has to be said, to this position where, you know, we, we've seen a bunch of stuff like g5, b4, and all sorts of crazy stuff, you know, where white goes f4, a5, f4, you, you get the f5 rather, you, you get the draw, right? Instead of what white can do sometimes in these positions is to play this move a3 here, stopping b4 from black, and that, once again, seems somewhat logical, but as I've discussed a million times here, time is of the essence, there's no time to waste here. And this, what this does a bit, essentially, is it just allows Black to execute all the strategic ideas they would love to in the world here. And one of them is knight b6, and we've seen this idea before, knight c4, and trying to win the darks with bishop like this is extremely unpleasant here. And if White continues advancing on the king's side, uh, albeit slightly slowly with this move, h4 here, Black can play knight c4. And the problem is, is that there's no easy option for White. Either they lose the darks with bishop, which we all know they don't want to, or they take on c4, and allow their knight to get shoved onto this passive a1 square. We also get the open b file now to use for an attack. This is also extremely unpleasant here. Uh, and so it just really goes to show that this sort of knight b6, knight c4 idea is something that you need to be very aware of. Uh, white needs to be very aware of, and it can be very strong with the black pieces uh, as well. This knight c4 idea that occurs many different types of situations. So I've shown a lot of strategic love for black in this video overall, but I also need to show some really uh, important ideas for white as well. I mean, I have definitely throughout the video, uh, but this one is really uh, kind of important, my opinion, to understand for both sides. Um, and it can be very dangerous, especially for black if you're not acquainted with this. So I'm going to show like this move h5 here, which I've once again already showed earlier. And generally speaking, actually against this line here, white's best option is to not even go for a long castle anymore since the whole attacking thing doesn't really work that well. And rather their best option is to actually go for these sorts of positions here where they play bishop e2 and castle short. And as we're going to see here, uh, one very nice plan in these sorts of positions is because once again we're not castling long, is play this move knight a5, attacking the b7 pawn, and black does not want to play b6 here because then knight c6 and knight has a very nice outpost here, so black has to play queen 7 rather, but then what we're going to do in the next few moves is we're going to start launching our queen side pawns forward, and ideally we'd love to play b4 and c5 eventually sometime in the future, we'll probably have to prepare this with a move like rook fc1, but that's sort of the dream, to be able to break on the queen side like that, and already at this point, it's not very easy for black to play. In fact, their best move back in this position was not to castle, instead to play b6 to really stop all this knight a5 stuff to begin with. And to just show some further moves here, to really show how bad this can get, let's say e4 here, this is a very common idea, trying to open up the e-file. White usually does not comply, they play f4 here, knight g4, and some further moves that might happen, rook a b1, b4 here. Rook AC8, Rook FC1, and it doesn't even really seem like Black did a whole lot. They played that move short castles earlier, which I explained isn't so great here. Uh, but with seemingly natural moves, they've ended up in a very passive position where C5 is coming next, trying to break through on the queen side here, and uh, Black is already in a fair bit of trouble here. And by the way, I should note that this whole structure uh, where, you know, we have a pawn on D5 like this, and Black is a pawn on E5, this is called the Bogoslavsky structure. Uh, it's a very important structure to know in all of the sorts of like Sicilian natural or Sicilian in general sorts of positions, these happen all over the place, and just being aware of these plans is very useful. And to give a bit more of an example from the black perspective of the Bogoslavsky, I want to show a blitz game of my own once again. So we had these moves here, we've seen a billion times, the uh, bishop e2 variation. Here white puts a bit of a strange move, bishop f3, but okay, we develop normally. Knight b7, once again, as I mentioned a million times, sort of our ideal setup, we go rook c8 here. Knight d5 here, and after takes, they create an invitation to the Boleslavsky structure here. And, you know, once again, because we understand that White's plan is to play on the queen side, if we move like c4 eventually, maybe push the b pawn if they can get this knight out of the body way here. What is our plan? Our plan, well, is to simply play on the king side. And very often what we're going to do is to play a move like knight e8 here, and then play a move like f5, which in this game my opponent was not very aware of. And he just simply invited f5 by putting his bishop on the square where I could play it with tempo here. And essentially, I got a very good position. I was able to play bishop g5, exchange darks with bishops off. And strategically, I had a very good thing going here. a5 here, I was able to play this, bring a knight into the lovely e5 square. And I had a really good position. I ended up spoiling a little bit, but nonetheless, up until this point, I, I had done 
pretty well here. I played all the right moves, I done the F5 stuff, and this is sort of like the dream when you have a black in the Bolosovsky structure here. So to wrap up the video, there's some more like miscellaneous sorts of things that I want to discuss. Uh, before we round things up, like these are things that you sort of like should know exist, but you don't really need that much in the Nazgul. And one of them is going to be in the Bishop G5 variation, the Poison Pawn line, where Black plays Queen B6 and they are greedy son of a bitch and they try to go for the B2 pawn here. And White could try to go for Knight B3, but this is just kind of a bit passive here. And very often Black sort of gets a more comfortable version of like the whole Bishop E7 lines we saw earlier. Uh, where in these positions they go like bishop e7, queen e7, knight b7, because compared to those positions here, white's knight is on the more passive b3 square instead of the more active knight d4 one, and if they, they could spend the tempo to go back to d4, but now they're an entire tempo down compared to the other variations, so it's not really something they should be too keen on going into, uh, which is why usually white will go queen d2 here, accept the challenge and bite the bullet, and instead Instead they go into this sort of thing where there's so many complicated moves, there's f5, there's e5. For example, one thing that happened, I think this was the 2021 candidate, so I think it was the 2020 or 2021 candidate, like, I literally can't even remember at this point. Oh yeah, I think it was like um the candidates got like rescheduled or something, they got can yeah, that, that whole mess. You guys probably know better than I do. <laughs> um, but yeah, 94 happened and after h6 here, well we had in, it was a game between MVO and Caruana here where there was some big drama here with queen e3, and this position had been seen a bunch here, except there was this whole thing where in this position, Caruana basically, I think it was, yeah, Caruana, he introduced this crazy novelty here, bishop c4, which seemingly looks like absolutely ridiculous, uh, stacking the piece here, and then went like bishop d6, and there was a whole lot of drama, he ended up winning a very nice game, if you've never seen it before, for whatever reason, you've been living under a rock, look up the damn game, it's really crazy stuff, it really just goes to show, how crazy the prep at the top level goes, um, but yeah, this was, this is one example of just how risky this thing can be, uh, with black here, if you play it, you really need to know your stuff, and all levels, I guess you can play anything and get away with it, but personally, um, I've never really had, uh, the balls to really play this with black here, it's incredibly risky here, I'd rather go for something a bit safe, like bishop e7 in this position here. And on a final note here, I want to talk about a very peculiar setup that Black can go for in the Najdorf, which is called the Dragodorf. And essentially, the Dragodorf is a combined setup of the, the Dragon and the Najdorf. So basically, what we're going to do in some of the lines where why go for something more positional, because the thing you have to understand about the Dragon is... It's sort of considered that the only critical line that White can go for is the so-called Yugoslav attack here, where they go for this whole long castles thing, and they try to start some sort of attack on the king side. And the all sorts of selves like Bishop E2, these are really non-threatening, and they're nothing to be afraid of. Uh, which brings us to these sorts of positions where White plays Bishop E2 in the Najdorf, where some clever players have decided that, you know what, let's play G6 here. And if White continues like playing castles and going for some sort of positional stuff, I'm happy with this because I basically have a dragon where like, okay, I play A6, but sort of a somewhat useful move there as well. And I'm sort of just fine if this does happen. Uh, so, you know, White might still try to transition though and go Bishop E3 and Queen D2 and Long Castles here, but it's not quite the same because they spent a tempo on Bishop E2, but Black's also spent a tempo on A6. It's not queer here, sometimes Black with H5 to really, once again, stop all these G4 ideas here. And all in all, like, is it completely sound? Not really, but it's definitely playable. And definitely playable against some serfs more than others, for example, against like A4 in the, the Nigelf here, it's very playable against this one because, once again, it's like here in the Bishop E2 line, right, like White could plausibly transition uh, to go into Bishop E3 and Queen D2. But when they play A4 already, this isn't really an option because as I mentioned earlier in the section on opposite side castling, you don't really want to castle long if you've played already a move like A4, it's just incredibly weakening. Uh, so against this, this is like one option, one line rather, where Going for the Dragodorf is quite interesting. Alrighty, and so this has been a long video. As some of you guys can tell, it's a little bit dark in the background because um, the sun's no longer out here. Uh, well, it's sort of out still, but nonetheless, that's pretty much it for the video. If you guys have enjoyed this, uh, make sure to leave a like. Leave any comments down below if you found this useful. Any feedback for these types of videos in the future. Any openings that you'd like to see me do more of this type of content on. But nonetheless, I hope you guys enjoyed this. Uh, have a good day and uh, stay tuned for the next one.